to take something out of order, we'll be taking item 3-1-J before the hearing of citizens. Andrea? Uh, does the classify career increments and sewer leak will introduce this item? Good afternoon, members of the board. Dr. Sirban, it's my pleasure uh, to assist in recognizing two classified employees for career increments. First, I'm going to invite Mike Bishop, grounds and uh, maintenance uh, supervisor to come up and to speak about Mike's career at the college is Julie Hendricks, Director of Facilities and Campus Development. Well, first, let me say, let me introduce you to Mike Bishop. Mike is somebody that's one of those unsung heroes who does not step out into the spotlight very often to receive such accolades. So when I received my email from Stella, and Mike actually agreed to accept this award, it put a great big smile on my face. Mike is one of the more fun people in my department to work with, for sure. <laughs> When I was hired, say, 10 years ago, my primary charge was to oversee the three supervisors in facilities, gr grounds, Mike, and the custodial maintenance supervisor. But Mike was the one that came to me with stories. There were just interesting stories that I had heard about Mike. So rather than coming at it from an authoritarian point of view, I thought, well, I'm going to get to know Mike and see what this is all about. And what I quickly realized is that Mike is an extremely competent and experienced supervisor in the grounds department, and that I can always rely on Mike for responsiveness, thoroughness, and the oversight of his staff. Um, Mike is the person every morning when I arrive who's left me a voice message at 6.30 in the morning telling me exactly the state of the campus. Mike is the person that after we have the storms and the rains and the winds and we all worry that Everything will be in disarray. He and his staff have arrived at 6, and they've put everything back in place, and everybody is able to drive on campus and not use their lifeboats. And <laughs> Mike is the person that if I have a contractor that comes to me and has some strange request about irrigation or something else, I know I can pick up the phone and call him, and he's always very reli reliable. And finally, Mike is the person that I know will always work cooperatively with all the other groups on campus, primarily groups like security and custodial, to do amazing things like at the top of the level, the graduation ceremonies and how beautiful they always look. And at the bottom of the scale, removing all the homeless camps out of our <laughs> restoration areas. So he really takes it from one end to the next. Um, I think, though, what impresses me the most about Mike is his pride in his crew. I think if you know Mike, his statement that he makes the most, his mantra is, it's a great crew, and he is really, really proud of them. And every year at Christmas time, I receive a photograph of he and all of his crew that I can update and put on my office wall. So. When I again was notified of this great honor, I put a big smile on my face and felt very honored to present Mike with his 20-year longevity award. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> and now it's my pleasure to invite Patricia Frank, theater stagecraft specialist, to come forward. And Katie Laris, chair of theater arts, is going to talk uh, with us about Patricia. Patricia is getting to be a regular at the <laughs> It is my uh, 
sublime pleasure to be able to talk a little bit about um, the incredible work Patricia Louise Frank, who we always refer to as Pat Frank, um, has done for all of us over the course of her 25 years of, of work um, at this college. She is our technical director. Um, what that means is she is solely responsible in many ways for uh, bringing the conception of the set designer to total fruition in the theater. Um, that involves um, taking care of plumbing, electricity, construction, um, painting, every aspect of uh, bringing to life a piece of theater um, to the stage. She began working here in, um, well, full-time. She started working uh, for a temporary or part-time technical director in February of 1985 and became a full-time technical director in May of 1985. Um, what the technical director has to do is to work and instruct students, and, and uh, Pat estimates she's worked with about 3,500 students over the course of her 25 years here. Um, that means making sure that nobody cuts an arm off, nobody loses an eye, um, and that she has had an extraordinary uh, track record with all of us, both in, in every way, in terms of safety, in terms of um, executing just gorgeous sets. Certainly anybody who's been to the Garvin or the Jerkowitz Theater over the past 25 years has seen what it takes to make um, the vision of a set designer a reality. Um, some of the things that uh, she has had to do includes um, just really complicated shows like Sweeney Todd, where there was a 40-foot bridge that was eight feet wide and 11 feet tall, flying in and landing on two nine-foot towers. I mean, you can imagine the engineering skill that this requires. Um, the Real Thing was a production that used a 24-foot diameter revolve so the entire set had to be able to spin around and reveal different aspects of the production. Or the Kentucky Cycle, which um, people who's, who had the pleasure of seeing that still talk about it, was this mammoth um, production, uh, hours and hours of time spent uh, watching the um, development of a family in Kentucky. And for that, she had to have a raked platform uh, filled with sand and ended up with a two-story set on wheels that was 30 feet wide and six foot deep. Um, I had the pleasure of beginning to work with um, Pat uh, from the time I began here in, in 2003. Um, and both as a, as a technical director and set designer, I can say that this is somebody that um, you trust the actor's lives with and you trust your own life with as you sort of move around um, the set and, and there's nobody I'd rather um, trust my life with and my actor's life with than Pat Frank. She is so tremendously dedicated. She um, will stay till two or three or four in the morning working away, making sure every prop is there, every design element is there. Um, and we are so, so thrilled that uh, at the end of this um, spring, as we said tearfully uh, goodbye to our beloved Tom Gary, we are saying hello to Pat as our new um, Director of Design and Technology, taking over from Tom Gary, and it, it couldn't be to a better person. So um, I'm thrilled to have her recognized in this way, and thank you so much, Pat, for everything you've done for the college. Thank you very much, Katie. That was very generous of you. Um, I just was going to take a little trip down memory lane. When I started out uh, here at City College in 1985, there was only one building on West Campus. And at 2 in the morning, if I was there at 2 in the morning, it was my responsibility to go through the entire building and make sure every door was locked because there was no security around at that time. Uh, we didn't go into 24-hour security until a little bit later. Now, of course, we have this beautiful West Campus with four wonderful buildings, beautiful fountains, uh, lovely sculptures, and uh, I, four 
unfortunately, a parking structure and additional parking. There was only two rows of parking when I started there. Hmm. Um, in my capacity as the TD for the Theater Arts Department, I've had to, the opportunity to do something different every day. And as Katie mentioned, some days I'm a plumber, some days I'm an electrician, many days I'm a painter. Um, and uh, what I've, my opportunity as the TD has been to work with students and watch them start with, uh, what's a paintbrush and where do I wash it to, you wanted to do a quarter inch line there or did you want to do a whole kind of different type of spatter technique? Uh, and many of our students now are working in the industry and are very uh, successful in the industry. So thank you very much for all those nice words, Katie. And I also would like to thank my partner who's been my biggest fan, Pat. Thank you. We move on to uh, hearings of citizens. We have uh, 10 requests today. We have 20 minutes to do that. You do the math, two minutes each. And try as best you can to hang on to those two minutes, or slightly less would be actually appreciated. Uh, Stephen Lewis is first, and Eleanor Larson will be second. Steve? Welcome. Uh, Mr. President and members of the board, I am pleased to be here. I wish I knew all of you personally. I know some of you personally. It's been my pleasure to work for the college for 20 years and uh, recently retire. A great place. It's wonderful to be here to have heard the accolades of our phenomenal employees. You're fortunate to have them. And I'm here today to, as a recent retiree, to voice my strong support for Dr. Saban as uh, their superintendent president. In these challenging times, dealing with budget issues, community issues, I think Dr. Saban has been phenomenal in her capacity to forecast, predict, and react and respond to the budget vagaries that come to us from Sacramento and from our very tax structure as it is. And I believe that the board's responsibility is to maintain, retain, attract the very best possible leadership. You have that leadership now in Dr. Saban. Thank you. Thank you. If, uh, if, the, if, if we can do something about the applause, I think it would be helpful. Just comment. Yes. I'm Eleanor Burns Larson, one of the co-presidents of ASIS. Uh, first of all, I would like to hand an additional set of signatures on our petition uh, added to the uh, close to 1,500 that we gave you at the last meeting. Uh, we want to talk to you about the budget. Uh, one of our members has written this and want to have it heard in this meeting. Uh, the, Ken Tompatrini wrote the following. A review of the tentative budget for 2011-2012 proposed by the administration is disappointing. Given the economic conditions of the state and the likelihood that apportionment funding will be reduced by 5.8 million next year, one would expect an austerity budget with significantly reduced expenditures. On the contrary, instead of a budget reflecting reductions in enrollment and classes, we have a budget that says SBCC is on a tremendous growth mode. Increased spending for academic and non-academic salaries and benefits, a whopping 15% for benefits, as well as a 14% increase in supplies and materials. Where are the 1.553 million of cost reductions associated with credit and non-credit, non-enhanced FTES reductions that have been presented to support scenario five? A 4.45 million increase for equipment replacement to six million versus this year's 1.6 million. 2.47 million increase for the construction fund 
to 3.75 million versus this year's 1.28 million. Where will this extra spending come from? The administration wants to spend down the reserves at the same time that academic programs for credit and non-credit are being reduced. Whose interests are being served by this budget? Certainly not the student body of SBCC who will see classes eliminated and tuitions increased or the community at large. Is this the type of leadership that the Board of Trustees feel that SBCC needs to deal with the future's financial and educational uncertainties? Now, I know Kathy should be next. She has the second part. Kathy, you are next. Mm -hmm. And following Kathy is Doug Hirsch. Good afternoon. As Eleanor said, I'm doing the second half of Dr. Tompatini's paper here. Publicly available data currently indicates the following conclusions. The current administrative leadership is dedicated to continuing to downsize the enhanced non-credit category of continuing education so that cumulatively since 0708, the number of student enrollment opportunities will have been reduced by more than 50%. SBCC is faced with many years of budget cuts and an increased focus on improving the educational statistics of degrees, certificates awarded, and a reduced number of dropouts. With these challenges, the administrative leadership's focus on only one part of continuing education seems too narrow and short-sighted. Conversion of non-credit, non-enhanced classes to community service classes may lead to a loss of center status for Wake and Chot, and a further loss of state revenues that support these facilities. More time is needed to develop a rational strategy and a plan for the degree, certificate, skill training, and lifelong continuing education programs. As part of this plan, the capabilities required of the educational and administrative workforce, the necessary facilities, infrastructure improvements or modifications, and the timing for technology upgrade implementations should be identified. The plan should be based on a realistic appraisal of the financial environment over the next three to five years with regards to both state and federal funding. No cost reduction should be taken off the table prematurely. Equipment replacement and construction projects should be delayed where possible until financial and enrollment conditions improve. A good start would be to freeze the budgets for these funds at the current year's actual levels. The total reserve balances in the general fund, the equipment fund, the construction fund, and the GPA fund are approximately 40 $4,000 as of the end of June 2011. The situation provides a financial cushion to undertake a comprehensive review over the next fiscal year to determine the impacts that the combination of state funding reductions and potentially declining California resident enrollments, all the effect these will have on SBCC in the future. Will it remain a local community institution or will it move to a more of a private school model with continued increases in non-resident enrollments? Now more than ever, SPCC's leadership should be reaching out to the community for input and guidance so that it can chart a course for the future. We think it's uh, very important that the multifaceted lifelong learning educational mission is continued in years ahead. The proposed 2011-12 tentative budget is really just not a satisfactory first step to SBC's future and needs to the drastically altered, re and then, oh, and needs to be drastically altered to reflect reality. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kathy. Doug Hirsch. And following Doug is Ray O'Connor. President, Superintendent Sorbonne, President Haslin, esteemed members of the board, thank you for this opportunity to speak with you again. I'm here in support of Dr. Andreas Sorbonne. And I'd like to start by saying 
that she is greatly esteemed at the college and in the community because she articulates a clear vision and she engages in ongoing dialogue with the college community. She is deeply engaged in the community and at the national and state level, and she has developed very effective relationships. In fact, she was named as one of the top 50 businesswomen in the Tri-Counties. Jeffrey Engler, the president-elect of the SBC Student Senate, says, with President Sorbonne's open lunch hours for discussion and her attendance at student events and activities, she allows students to openly voice their opinions and concerns. Dr. Sorbonne is fiscally savvy. She's ended the 2010-2011 year with strong reserves. She ensures support for numerous student success activities. Working with President Sorbonne, we navigated three difficult years with no layoffs or furloughs of regular employees with solid reserves and no need for borrowing. Rosette Strandberg says, I commend and respect the decisions you have made. You have a difficult job ahead of you, encountering those who displace their frustrations and harbor unrealistic expectations. And so I wish you energy, strength, and support. President Sorbon is a transformational leader. She prepared the college for an extremely positive ACCJC accreditation visit with nine commendations praising the college and the administration. She supports the development of new programs for workplace training. In fact, this academic year, our diagnostic medical sonography program received its initial accreditation. President Sir Bonds provided the leadership for Measure V, our first issuance of bonds. Linda Masias writes, you've done so much for this college. Thank you for remaining our president. And President Sorbonne is focused on student success and the SBCC mission. In fact, the awards, recognitions, and grants we received in 2010-11 are the strongest the college has ever had. For the first time in its history this academic year, SBCC was recognized as one of the 101 best for vet colleges and universities in the United States. And Dr. Sorbonne is recognized at the national level and was appointed to the U.S. National Committee for UNESCO by Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. She was recognized as well by the Board of Directors of the National Association of Professional Women as the 2011-12 Professional Woman of the Year. Dr. Sorbonne is resolute and trustworthy. Liz Auchincloss writes that Andrea is trusted by the classified staff because she has proven over the last three years as president superintendent that she understands and respects the important role which we play in the operation of the college. D Dean Nevins, SBCC faculty senate president-elect, writes that Dr. Sorbonne successfully transitioned the college's department level funding process away from the previous Fund 41 model to one which provides much greater transparency and reflects to a larger degree the actual costs of running the college. President Sorbonne showed her trustworthiness by living up to every promise made with regard to funding departments. President Sorbonne has many supporters within SBCC, within the community, throughout the state, and at the national level. As Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And therefore, I ask you, esteemed members of the board, all of you, to please be agents of unity, not division, to work cooperatively and collegially with our president, to stand behind her through good times and bad, to give Dr. Sorbonne the unequivocally positive evaluation that she has earned, to add the traditional year to her contract, and finally, for the sake of the college, please do your part to put this destructive chapter behind us. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Great. I might take back that olive branch I offered you yesterday. 
I asked to speak today so that my comments will become part of the public record. I've given each of you some of the pertinent information that I hope to cover, and I'm going to try to do it in two minutes, Peter. I believe that the board is in violation of both its own board policy 21, uh, 2315 and the California Government Code section 54957.1. Why? A closed session was held yesterday for the announced purpose of conducting an evaluation of the performance of the superintendent president in accordance with the terms of her contract. The board reconvened after that session and the board president announced that the evaluation of Dr. Serban had been completed, but failed to provide the result of action taken or the votes of the individual members on this issue as required by both the board's own policy and the government code section 5497. I vehemently protest what I and many others view as a strategy to avoid revealing your vote on the matter. And in anticipation that you will claim that such action is not required in this case, I have prepared a short list of citations from government codes and board policy. I think the first thing is to lay to rest what is meant by action taken. And I quote from section 54952.6 of the government code. As used in this chapter, action taken means a collective decision made by a majority of the members of a legislative body, which by the way, City College is, a collective commitment or promise by a majority of the members of a legislative body to make a positive or a negative decision or an actual vote by a majority of the members of a legislative body when sitting as a body or entity upon a motion, proposal, resolution, order, or ordinance. How can you possibly deny that you have taken action when you conducted an evaluation and arrived at a conclusion? Now here's what the government code says about action taken in a closed session. What does it say? It says it provides, quote, the legislative body of any local agency shall publicly report any action taken in closed session and the vote or abstention of every member present as follows. Action taken to appoint, employ, dismiss, accept the resignation of or otherwise affect the employment status of a public employee in closed session shall be reported at the public meeting during which the closed session is held. Finally, here's the language from the board policy. After any closed session, the board shall reconvene an open session before adjourning and shall, consistent with law, announce any actions taken in closed session and the vote of every individual board member present. And should you question whether the provisions that I've cited apply to City College, I've included a clarification of what it means to be a legislative body or, an, or in a local district. Now the the thing that concerns me and many others who have addressed this board previously is that it appears that from the very start, the majority of the board members have had their own agenda. Why else would on the very first meeting after you were sworn in, would there be a single topic selected for that meeting which was the evaluation of Dr. Serban. And why would it take the form of hiring an outside attorney to advise you how to accomplish your goals when the college has and pays an attorney for her advice? I just 
have difficulty believing that your actions are going to contribute to the survival of this college in a meaningful way, much as you might think they are. You have created unrust and mistrust among the members of the college community. When you fail to announce the results of your deliberations after concluding the evaluation, that was just another brick in the load that you bring. And I really hope that you will consider wisely before you make this action official. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anna Fagan. Following Anna Fagan, is it uh, Dana Hagenkoff? Hi. That's you? Okay. Um, my name is Anna Fagan. I am an alumni and recent graduate of SBCC, class of 2011. I am transferring to a four-year school, San Francisco Art Institute, to get my BFA in printmaking. I have taken classes through both SBCC to, for my degree and last year started taking adult ed classes for fun. By taking classes from each, I have seen both sides. In the last couple of weeks my, in my adult ed classes, I, in my adult ed wire wrapping class, the topic of budget has come up. When I try to voice my opinion, I always get shushed by the older and more traditional adult ed students. A couple of students I have had, or a couple of times I've had to leave the room because I can't stand listening to them go off on the fact that classes may cost more or get canceled. I am tired of constant Dr. Servan bashing that occurs in my classes. If I try to voice my opinion, I am ignored or told I don't know the facts because I'm too young. At least I gather information with an open mind and try to make an informed opinion. The funding should be put towards classes that are for credit. I have had credit-based classes canceled due to budget cuts. Then I have to scramble to get um, into another class that is full already. I enjoy adult ed classes and find them relaxing after a long week of school but I think credit classes should take priority over the people that are classes over people who take them to keep busy. Um, credit classes are helping students get a degree and able to keep up with um, the ever-changing world. I am working towards the degree to better myself and my future so that I can make a difference. I think that that takes priority over wire wrapping, book binding, and drawing in nature, adult classes that I have taken in my free time, to pass my free time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Dano is to be followed by Judy Meyer. Good afternoon, my name is Dano Pagenkoff. Um, I'm troubled by something that I'm seeing and things I'm reading in the newspaper lately about what's going on here. It seems there's a lack of representation on the part of credit-based students. And I also note the absence of the student trustee on this board. And that's because of summer vacation. But uh, these are very important things that are happening right now. And the student voice does need to be heard. Um, I respectfully support Dr. Sherbon. She's an amazing person and has done a great deal for this school. I transferred from Santa Barbara City College into the chemical engineering program at University of California, Santa Barbara. Part of that, being a, an average student in the engineering sense of the word, um, I think a big part of me getting into that school was Dr. Serban wrote a letter of recommendation and helped me increase my chances of getting there. I am forever grateful, but it shows how much she cares about students and our success, credit-based students. Um, I'd also like to speak on priorities. Do credit-based education take priority over adult education? Um, I'd like to say that without a credit-based university, there would be no accreditation for the school. And with that, 
there would be no adult education program. Adult education is basically the icing on the cake of this school. It is not extremely common to have an adult ed program um, associated with a community college in the state of California. It just goes to show the success that this school has due to the outstanding past leadership that this school has had. The school seems divided on the lines of adult education and in underrepresented credit-based education. I appeal to the common sense of the adult ed constituency and ask that we all begin to show Dr. Serban a little more gratitude and a lot less attitude. Thank you. Judy. Thank you, Peter. Good afternoon, President Sarbonne, President Peter, and members of the board. I'm Dr. Judith Evans Meyer, Professor of Medical Microbiology. Yesterday was a pivotal day in the 100 year history of Santa Barbara City College, one of which I am not proud of. The third evaluation meeting was scheduled by the Board of Trustees at 4 o'clock with a public session followed by a closed session. The room was full of supporters, many more than are here today. And many of them were here to speak on behalf of Dr. Servat. They joined other community members, staff, and students from prior meetings who also expressed their heartwarming support for her leadership as president of this college. There were 16 speakers. Len Jarrett, Stephen Wright, Marla Arnaldi, Leatrice Loria, Doug Hirsch, Dr. Richard Fulton, Frank Shipper, Liz Auchincloss, Dr. Nick Benson, Mark McIntyre, Ray O'Connor, Joyce McFeeder, Jose Negroni, a veteran student who has enjoyed this college after having a bad experience at two others, Oscar Corona, another student who has enjoyed the pleasures of this college after having been turned away from others. Joanne Fonari, and all of us know our beloved Silvio Dallaretta. They all spoke eloquently and graciously in support of the extraordinary positive tenure of Dr. Serban here in her three years at Santa Barbara City College. Numerous accolades were repeated again and again with the same theme, concluding by asking that this board be given a satisfactory evaluation and a one-year extension of Dr. Serban's contract. It was a feel-good session. We all felt that after such vote of confidence from such a diverse representation of the community, that the Board of Trustees would finally listen and do the right thing. Many of us waited the two hours for the results, hoping for the best. They returned from the closed session, concluded that they reconvened the open session. It was apparent the Board had been coached on this evaluation process. They didn't look at us. We weren't even in the room. Peter reported that the evaluation process had been completed and adjourned the meeting immediately. They stood up and left. The air was thick and sad. Well, we have not been officially informed and may never be because the closed session is confidential, but the body language was loud and clear. It was the impression of everybody in that room that the board had not performed as requested by the numerous speakers and the 750 signatures and more. We got those signatures in just one day. And on the letter of support, we feel they did not give her a satisfactory evaluation and they did not extend her contract. To the board, I've been a teacher at this college for 36 years always proud of my five presidents that I worked with, 
always proud of my Board of Trustees and of my faculty that I worked with and of the staff and of my dean and of my wonderful EVP who's always there for us and particularly for our students. Today, I stand here ashamed of the behavior of this board and the perpetuation of a divided college. You are supposed to be part of the solution. That's why we elected you, not the problem. We are in this together, continue education and credit. We stand united. It has never been them and us, not until this happened. So let's please start this healing process. And please listen to the speakers and do what they're asking you to do. I thank you. Dr. Mendelson. Dr. Mendelson. Yes, you are next. And uh, then Addie Garfinkel is following Dr. Mendelssohn. Dr. Sarban, President Haslin, uh, just for everyone's information, a uh, little history, I am a retired professor of medicine at UCSF and have been involved with lifelong learning at various institutes, uh, last being Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Uh, I'm here to ask that the board consider any lifelong learning institute here be the monies come and be allocated through the university, but that the entire function of how the institute is run is done by people in the community. To give you an example, when I first got here, moving here from uh, the uh, San Luis Obispo area, I was aware that the Osher Institute was giving out grants for $100,000 for four years, three years, and then at the end of the three years, if they're up and running, there would be a grant of a million dollars. We uh, applied for that through the uh, a study group in the in the San Luis area, and were given the grant. The money came to Dean Parks, but all the work was done by members of the community, not existing faculty at the university. Uh, and if you look nationwide, there are about 500 uh, of these lifelong learning institutes going on currently funded in various ways that I'm aware of. And the most successful ones are done where the community, te the, it's peer taught as opposed to, so that it doesn't detract from the university, but in fact, having people involved there and the community involved increases the amount of, of donations and interest of the senior population as relates to the university and doesn't distract because of space or parking. So when I moved here, I had talked to uh, uh, President Romo and told him about this and he had uh, asked me if I would serve on the advisory board for the adult ed, which I have done. And what I'm concerned about is that in spite of being very gracious to me, I met with President Serban and offered this information in these contacts and uh, told her that I was uh, in touch with the person who was head of the Osher Institute in San Luis, I mean in San Francisco, that I was aware that the UCSB had gotten the money and had not uh, really provided much coursework at all compared to what we did at, at Cal Poly. Uh, I spoke with her, I think at that meeting was the head of the foundation at that time and another member, and uh, I knew that she was new on the job and had many other responsibilities 
And then I followed up on that, and I think another time uh, there was a, a planned vacation, which is understandable. But what I'm asking this board to consider is that there's plenty of data available through existing, continuing lifelong education for people in retirement that adds to the university as opposed to distracting from it. And I'll be happy to provide that at a later time should you want it my input, thank you. And thank you for letting me come directly from the hospital looking like a bum, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Mendelson. Uh, Addie? Good afternoon, members of the board, President Sirbon, President Hosland. I didn't quite expect to be back talking to you at this podium again under these circumstances. I'm not here to talk to you about the budget but about priorities and about unity. Unity as in being a cohesive unit. The amount of time spent on the review of one employee's contract was not only excessive, but unfair to the employee, the students, yourselves, and the community of constituents. We all know it takes work to be a unit, so I ask you to put personal preconceived notions aside and to work together. The Board of Governors and the Chancellor's Office has given you directives for the priorities of this college. In those directives, it has specifically said credit side, it has specifically said things along the lines of vocational education and degree completion. That comes from the state. I ask that you keep SBCC the jewel of the system, that you follow the directives that were already given to you as a unit. Please make your decisions about what you think is best for the students first thinking about what is best for the students first. And if you aren't sure what's best for the students, please ask us because we are always more than ready to tell you. And like, so is everybody else. Right now, I think we have to move on as directed by the uh, Chancellor's Office, but in unity. In conclusion, I am also very curious about what the results of yesterday's evaluation were, and it is within the purview of the board to respond to public comment if they so choose. Okay. Um, I think I can offer a, a word. It was, it was uh, as a consequence of, of legal counsel that um, has advised us that a closed session evaluation of the superintendent president like like a closed session evaluation of anybody, um, is, uh, is a confidential matter. And um, we were advised further that the Brown Act provisions relating to reporting closed session actions do not apply to anything that occurred in connection with this evaluation. And hence, nothing was required to be or should be reported out of closed session. Okay, we move on to the agenda. Thank you all for participating. Um, mm. I thought I was supposed to speak on, not about the politics of the evaluation, but about the 2.4. Uh, yeah, okay. That's what you did. Okay, um, but you, you didn't ask to speak at 2.4, you asked to speak at this regular section, but we will remember. We move on to uh, item 1.5, which are the, the approval of the minutes of the regular meetings, March 24th and April 28th and May 26th. Uh, shall we do them one at a time, or do you want to? One at a time. One at a time, okay. Uh, can we approve, can I have a motion to approve the minutes of March 24th? So moved. Second? Second. Discussion? Yeah, um, there were two, is this on I think? There were two corrections that I put in and they weren't made to the uh, minutes. Um, we've seen these minutes before. One was on page, um, boop, 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 boop. it was uh, page four to change canon to can. It's a silly little one, but I had already made that and it didn't happen. On page eight, I wanted my abstention to be noted, and it wasn't on there. And you went back and listened to the recording, and there was no voicing of an abstention. You are kidding me. And you went back and listened. I didn't listen. I'm telling it. you, 
I did abstain. And I had a microphone, maybe it wasn't on, I don't know. But, it, but you know, that's okay. It doesn't matter to me. I'm not gonna argue about it. The other thing is on page 14 there, two, there's a, I circled a couple words because I think it would be more um, fitting, I'm trying to get to page 14 here, more fitting to take those words out and they are, I'm sorry, I can't quite get to 14, there it is. Um, after Trustee Livingston asked the, the cost for Mr. Price, Mr. Price noted to the extent that it's a concern of the board, he won't charge anything. And then you added, um, Trustee Villegas said so moved. And I don't think that was a motion. I think he just said that because, well, he'll have to tell us why, but I don't think it was a real motion. It wasn't seconded. There wasn't anything there. So I think those words should be taken out of there. But the two things, and you know, if you don't want me to have said I abstained, I know I did, and I don't really care. But you know, it's okay, Angie didn't nothing. hear it, and Angie went on purpose to verify. Uh, I would also like to suggest it would be very helpful if President Haslund, when motions are made, uh, it helps us with the minutes to point out who voted yes, no, and abstentions. That will make it easier for the very correct reporting on the minutes. So. Okay. So I take these as corrections to the minutes of March 24th. Are there others? Uh, are we ready to vote on the minutes of March 24th? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Roll motion. Call. Motion. I suppose you need a roll call. Is that what we'll need to do is roll call? Well, when everybody's. A, uh, yes, it's clear, but when we have divided votes, that's when yeah. it will be helpful to make sure no, we my, record. My understanding of this motion is that there is unanimous consent to approve these. No, I'm abstaining. Not, okay. I'm abstaining. Abstentions. I'm okay, I'm sorry. I should have called for abstentions. One, two, three abstentions. Okay. Um, with that vote, the minutes are not approved. Uh, we will we'll move on to the minutes of April 28th. Move approval of minutes on April 28th. Joan moves to approve. Is there a second? Second. Luis, uh, a second. Discussion of the minutes of April 28th. Yes. Um, I'd like to say that I'm pleased that these are shorter. And I have a correction on page four. Um, under 1.5, the second paragraph, it says, because there was not a quorum on this item, the minutes were not approved. I don't think quorum is the word. I think it's majority. Um, okay. So that should be corrected. Yeah, majority is correct. Okay. So that correction being taken into account, is there further discussion, Luis? I think it might be helpful if maybe uh, not a roll call, but a show of hands so that we're absolutely clear right. on who's voting which way and maybe hold it at least a few seconds so that Angie can accurately uh, capture okay. who's voting how. We move on to approval of the minutes as corrected of April 28th. All in favor, please raise your hand. Uh, abstentions? And rejections of this motion? Nobody? Okay, one abstention. We move on to the final May 26th. Is there a motion to approve the minutes of May 26th? So moved. So. Luis moves and Lisa seconds. Discussion of the minutes of May 26th? Yes. I just have a, a question. I note that the minutes um, on page 11 say that um, there would not be a need for a court reporter, and though we all uh, much enjoy uh, the presence of our court reporter, um, I think we've said, talked several times about uh, eliminating that expense, so I'm wondering where we are on that. As I explained several times, the issue is for us to be able to also reduce the number of meetings and length of meetings uh, such that uh, Angie can handle the minutes on her own. So I'm hoping that as we work on the schedule for meetings for the next six months of this calendar year, uh, by, by reducing the number of meetings and by maybe having a priority of items to discuss that will help us to not need this assistance. The assistance right now is needed for us to keep up and because it's, um, 
Angie cannot by herself at this point keep up with that. We need this help. Um, as we discussed last time, the desire is not if there are issues that really require the committees to meet, absolutely. But I think, as you recall, we discussed last time, uh, we, we currently have um, four uh, committees of the board. Uh, if each committee meets every time, plus a study session, plus a board meeting, we are at six board meetings per month. And that has created the need for additional assistance to keep up with the minutes. So that's really the issue. Uh, whether a core reporter here is not, we'll need some way to have transcriptions that helps getting the minutes done, because Angie really can listen to this recording so many times, so many hours to get the minutes done. It's just too much volume of listening. So really the issue is we need a solution to this, and that was a solution we found to be able to keep up. The motion before us is to approve the minutes of, of right. uh, May 26th. I hear no amendments to the, or, or corrections to the minutes, so we'll take a vote. All in favor, please raise your hand. One, two, three, four. Opposed? One. Mm -hmm. Opposed? Abstentions? Two? Abstention because I wasn't present since okay. abstentions are happening for various reasons. I want to make it clear it's simply because my presence was not at that meeting, so therefore okay. I'm abstaining on that ground. Thank you for that clarification. 1.6, communications, report from the Academic Senate. Uh, Dean Nevins, are you here? There you are. Uh, board President Hasland, board members, Superintendent President Servan. Uh, this is my first appearance before the board as the Academic Senate President, and I would like to thank the Vice President of the Academic Senate, Kimmy Neufeld, uh, for doing such a good job at the last board meeting report. Um, I had dashed out a report on my iPhone from Germany, and Kenley had translated that gibberish into something uh, approximating a really good speech, so I'm we're thankful to Kenley. Uh, in the intervening several weeks since the Senate had not, has not met, so currently I have nothing to report. Uh, <coughs> don't get used to this. It's going to be much longer in the future, I'm sure. Uh, the Academic Senate looks forward to working with the board and the superintendent president through SBCC's processes to address the myriad of difficult decisions that we face as an institution. By working together, I believe that we can surmount these issues and emerge as a much stronger and more vibrant institution. Thank you. Thank you, Dean. Uh, there's no report from the associated <laughs> students. Uh, report on classified employees, Liz Altrincloss. Good afternoon, members of the board, Mr. President. <clears throat> Our consultation group hasn't met since the last meeting, uh, so I won't report from them. But I do want to report on our classified in-service that we're having tomorrow. I thank the district for providing this time for us. Uh, it's tomorrow. There are several uh, uh, topics that people can choose from. There is uh, one called Coming Up for Air Stress Management. PERS retirement formulas, service credit, retirement payment options, uh, evacuation and standard emergency management system, work as a team, play as a team, and triage and disaster first aid. People can pick uh, three out of those. Most of them are morning. Uh, one of them continues on into the afternoon. And there's lunch starting at 11.45 in the Campus Center. Staff have the choice of tri-tip chicken or lasagna. Our president will be uh, speaking to us, and so I want to just thank everyone and remind everybody that the in-service is tomorrow. And as far as other things, I have requested to speak at item 2.1, so I'll be back. Thank you. A uh, report from uh, our PIO, Joan Galvan. Good afternoon, President Haslin, President Sarban, and members of the board. In terms of major media coverage in the last three weeks, the May 26 board meeting was covered by the Santa Barbara Independent and KEYT TV Channel 3. Commencement follow up coverage was featured in the May 27th Ed Haddon News Hawk, the June 1st Santa Barbara Independent, and the June 3rd Santa Ynez Valley News. Dr. Ophelia Arellano's editorial with a continuing education update ran in the May 29th Santa Barbara News Press. 
Softball pitcher Kylie Schneider signing with Colorado State University was covered on June 2nd by KSBY TV Channel 6, the Santa Barbara News Press, and the Santa Maria Times. Construction delays at SBCC due to lack of state funding was reported in the June 6 Santa Barbara Independent Online. Dr. Andrea Serban was interviewed in a June 6 Newshawk article regarding the U.S. Supreme Court ruling upholding California Assembly Bill 540, which allows children of illegal immigrants to pay in-state college tuition fees. The foundation for SBCC's student fundraising campaign was featured in the June 8th Newshawk. The associate degree nursing program graduation was covered in the June 8th Ed Hat, and the Students and Free Enterprise Club's project to help a Carpinteria Realty Company improve its sustainability practices was featured in the June 9th News Hawk. Are there any questions? Thank you. No questions. Thank you, Joan. Uh, Andrea, you are next. Uh, good afternoon, members of the board, uh, colleagues members of the community. First, I would like to acknowledge and thank uh, all faculty, staff, students, donors, and community members who have so eloquently and positively articulated their support for me and for the college over the last few weeks. As Ms. Liluria, a longtime friend and major donor to the college, said yesterday, it is particularly important in these challenging times to look at the whole picture, consider the entire mission of the college, and do what is best for our students. And we all need to remember that we are here for our students and their success. And that has been the hallmark of what has made this BCC the premier college that it is. And I hope we will continue to focus on that and remember what is truly important. I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Dean Navis as the president of the Academic Senate. Uh, I too look forward to working with you, Dean, and um, I'm glad that Ignacio continues to come because I'll miss Ignacio, so I'm glad he's here. Uh, our credit summer session will start on Monday, June 13, and unlike many other community colleges around the state, which have reduced significantly or completely eliminated the summer sessions, because we are in the excellent fiscal shape that we are and we can afford to take a phased approach to uh, implementing what we believe to be upcoming cuts, we are able to offer this summer the same number of classes on the credit side as last summer. Students are very much aware of the need to register as early as they can, and they do. At this time, headcount enrollment for summer is up by 3% at a similar point in time last summer, and cumulative unit enrollment is up by 5.6%. I would like to thank again all faculty who are actually taking more students in their sections than uh, the normal limits. That's how we are able to accommodate more students even though the number of sections has remained the same as last summer. We are still waiting to hear from Sacramento regarding the state budget. And personally, I'm not holding my breath because if it's going to be as last year, we'll have to wait until the end of September to really know what the final rendering of the budget is. Meanwhile, I would like to continue to encourage uh, all employees, students, community members to please email us at budget at sbcc.edu, budget at sbcc.edu, with your ideas about um, generating new revenues or reducing expenditures. We have received a number of ideas already, which we are collating, and we are going to highlight them for the board of our upcoming study session on June 23rd. Do not worry, those of you who have had some really controversial ones, no names are given, all suggestions are anonymous. Uh, June 1st, the Foundation for SBCC officially launched the Campaign for Student Success, a phone fundraising campaign aiming to raise $500,000 for our students and programs. And the Winslow Maxwell Charitable Trust is offering a match of 50 cents on every dollar for every donation made now through June 30th. The offer lends a sense of urgency and scale to the campaign for student success as $250,000 must be raised at a minimum to receive the match. 
Uh, so I really want to extend my thanks to all foundation staff uh, who are really great to work with, to the numerous volunteers who have signed up, who really believe in the mission of SBCC and the success of our students. Thank you for helping us. On June 3rd, tomorrow, uh, approximately 60 students are expected to participate in the adult high school GED graduation hosted by SBCC Continuing Education at 6 p.m. in the Student Services Plaza. And this is a very important moment, and I appreciate Dr. Haslung agreeing to um, hand the diplomas with our uh, uh, Vice President of Continuing Education. I know that the students will appreciate having you there, and I also appreciate um, other board members who are SVP. They, they, really, they really appreciate your presence. I would like to congratulate Ignacio Ponce in the American Sign Language Program and our Veterans Affairs Program coordinated by Magdalena Torres for winning the Rice Diversity and Equity Award from the California Community Colleges Board of Governors. Ignacio received the award as an individual recipient and the Veterans uh, Support Program was the program award recipient. We submitted nominations for two of three possible categories and both won. And I'd like to mention that Ignacio is our first full-time American Sign Language faculty in the college's School of Modern Languages, and he has been responsible for expanding the program from about 100 students to 200 students in the American Sign Language. The SBCC Veteran Student Program is continuing to do a fabulous job because of Magdalena's thoughtful leadership and novel ideas and relentless pursuit of doing everything possible for our veteran students. So I want to thank both Ignacio and Magdalena for the great job you are doing for SBCC. We will be honored in Sacramento on July 11 by the Board of Governors and other dignitaries on hand. Even the governor was invited, whether he will show up or not remains to be seen. Uh, I would also like to congratulate uh, SBCC Theater Group uh, for winning three awards in this year's Independent Theater Awards competition. Uh, once again, our theater arts department is doing a great job. And uh, I will also like, last but not least, to congratulate the employees who have reached benchmark years of service uh, this month. Mike Bishop who was here earlier, 20 years. Emma Cruz, 10 years, Patricia Frank, 25 years, Thomas Harberson, 10 years, Ricky Hunter, 15 years, and Jose Rodriguez, 10 years. Uh, it's a pleasure to have staff that have this dedication for our college, and we owe them a great deal for, uh, for all the work they do, so thank you so much on behalf of all of us at SBCC. Thank you. Thank you. We move on to item two, um, and the first item on our agenda. Thank you. Did I miss something? Yeah. Oh, I, ap I apologize. Uh, report from members of the board. Yeah, one, two. Um, I was just going to um, ask Dr. Serban to place a discussion of the question of pay rates for employees who are hourly workers paid on grants, which was raised at our um, May 12th board meeting and public comment by uh, Sandra Padilla, I think, and Blanca Bush. <clears throat> and I was asking if we could put that on our next fiscal subcommittee meeting for discussion. Sure. Okay. Luis? Yeah, I uh, first would like to thank everyone that uh, addressed the board this evening. And um, actually, but I'm very concerned with Mr. O'Connor's remarks and with the document that was handed to us. So as a member of the governing body, I would like to ask Dr. Haslin to seek a second legal opinion on um, how our reporting was handled, because I'm very concerned after reading this document. And if you could uh, report back to us uh, on that second legal opinion. Be glad to. Other comments? OK, now we move on to item two. And 2.1 is a public hearing, uh, but first the adoption of a resolution that moves us into a committee of the whole to focus on the budget. Is uh, Dr. Haslam, before yeah. doing that, can I make just some summary comments on, on this? 
okay. very briefly. I think it's important uh, to do so because um, actually we can also briefly respond to a number of the comments made under hearing of citizens um, that I think the public deserves an answer and we have the information and we can do it very quickly. But I would like to first make a general statement that a tentative budget is exactly that, tentative. And the word is used on purpose. Um, by uh, the statutes that govern California community colleges, we have a tentative budget that needs to be approved by June 15. That is simply a first take or a first cut, uh, and then uh, that allows us to pay bills starting July 1st as opposed to the state of California. We cannot issue IOUs or any of that. We actually need to have a budget passed. And then there is an adopted budget that obviously uh, it's worked through between now and September, and then uh, you uh, are presented um, for discussion, review, and approval an adopted budget in September. Um, we work through an iterative process at this college, um, and every year between the tentative budget and the adopted budget, there are always changes. So I want to make it clear uh, and I made it clear at prior meetings, but I would like to reiterate that this is the first take to the budget. And the adopted budget, as I mentioned to you, and I know you have looked, every year you can verify yourself there are changes made. So it's also an issue of the information that's available from the state. And actually right now, we don't know what the state budget is going to be. Uh, based on various changes between the January first presentation from Governor Jerry Brown through the May revise on May 16, many different versions of information came from the state. The way we work is to take the best piece of information we have at any one point in time and try to come up with a proposal for a budget. Um, I want to uh, recognize and acknowledge again the work that trustees Macker and Kroniger did in looking at the various uh, pieces of information that were we presented to you through the various fiscal and study sessions. And I want to reiterate again, uh, which I mentioned before, projections that we presented for years out are constantly refined. Those projections I mentioned that they are work in progress because the assumptions need to change based on the information we have. They also need to change based on the direction we receive from you as a board. And obviously, we welcome and need your direction as to where your vision of the budget is. So I want to be very clear about that. We are already engaged, actually, in a refinement work and more work with the college community. So this is just that, a tentative budget. It's not the adopted budget, and there is much more work that we know and we are already engaged in doing. And because questions were raised about the construction and equipment funds, I would like um, Leslie Grifflin, our controller, to very briefly speak to that, very briefly, and Paul Bishop also even more briefly, uh, to address very quickly a question from the uh, comments under hearing of citizen relative to the replacement of, of uh, equipment uh, in the technology area. Good afternoon. I'd like to uh, direct you to two pages appendices that we put into this budget presentation, which allows us to present more information about the utilization of funds within the equipment fund and in the construction fund. And these uh, appendices pages 15 and 16 of the budget presentation. And if I might just go to those pages and highlight some of the information you're going to see there. For the equipment fund on page 15, um, we have provided under the expenditure area detail, more detail as to what the funds are being utilized for. Um, just to quickly go down the page, we're showing you that we replace the copiers on campus. We have for our IT division, we have the refresh of the computer systems uh, here on campus. <clears throat> 
excuse me. Uh, we have uh, a number of program and review requests that came from our program and review process, and this is our chance as managers who are working on the goals of the college and the mission of the college to express or articulate what are our needs in order to get our jobs done. These requests are forwarded, prioritized, and then um, incorporated into the budget. And here you can see uh, what kinds of uh, expenses were incorporated in the budget for this current year and going forward for next year. Um, for the next page, it's page 16. This is the construction fund. You're going to find here more information on the projects that we have already uh, set up for this current year and what the projects will be going forward into the next year. So you can see, for instance, uh, we had um, remodeling, upgrading, uh, replacement, that kind of thing going on on campus. So you can see the actual projects that we have uh, active and then planned for the coming year. So I'm hoping that provides you with more detail. Um, there's a lot more detail under all of these numbers, of course, but it would give you an idea of the activity that is being funded through our budget process. I just, I just want to say thank you to Dr. Serban and to Business mm -hmm. Services for this additional detail. I think it answers a lot of um, people's questions. Mm -hmm. okay. And as we move into the um, final documents for the proposed adopted budget, a little more detail on the 3.1 million program review projects would be great. I know that you haven't fine-tuned that yet, right. but this is excellent. I really appreciate mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your work. Okay. Thank you. Well, first I'd like to say thank you for letting the camera see my face for the first time. You know, the back of my head's been in every video. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I'm going to address, you know, the, the issue of, you know, the 1.4 million that is in the computer refresh budget. Uh, this is an increase, you know, some people, as people have mentioned, this seems to be this capricious increase over last year. However, this budget isn't just, we don't sort of just pick a number. You know, it's all based on our inventory and the age of the inventory, and we, we actually do it in a fairly logical way. Any piece of equipment that reaches the age of now, five years before December 30th of the next budget year is included in that year for being replaced. And, and, and we're very specific about what equipment actually gets on that list. It's not just any piece of equipment. It's ones that we've approved that are dedicated to faculty, staff, or other administrative purposes. Um, it, sometimes people get older equipment that they need to have around just for testing or other things. Those aren't on that refresh cycle. Now, next year, we, you know, our budget comes up to about 1.4 million. This is, this is like the perfect storm in a way because we moved from a three-year cycle to a four-year cycle to a five-year cycle. We're finding, see, you know, they now all have their peaks. Uh, we've had a couple of low years. Last year was a bit of a peak. Next year is going to be a bigger peak. You know, just to give you an idea why, uh, there were a, Apparently five years ago, we replaced a lot of the large student labs with new equipment, and they're all coming due. Uh, in this case, our School of Media Arts with about 244 computers that will be placed across all of their labs. Uh, the Learning Resource Center with 144 computers in, in their uh, CHI labs and out in their general use areas. Uh, at Modern Languages with almost 100 computers being replaced in the next year. So. It, this is all about, you know, the biggest part of this is about replacing lab computers. And, and the problem is we can't really put them on a six-year cycle because we're already getting lots of complaints that because of equipment failures in, in the fifth year, more and more machines are down for repair. Students can't use those seats, and it's impacting the ability to use those labs. Um, so, you know, I don't think a six-year you know, cycle would be reasonable or uh, beneficial to our student in the programs that, that use that equipment. Any questions? Thank you. And just to add one more uh, to this uh, equipment fund, we deliberately in 2008-9 and in 2009-10, we have actually 
stop spending, almost literally. That was a measure we took uh, in the face of great fiscal uncertainty. Um, however, and that's also the year when we decided to move uh, from the refresh cycle of computers from three years to five years. So now time is catching up with us. Um, we also uh, made an effort actually to reduce spending significantly over these last three years uh, by keeping positions that became vacant open as long as we could, eliminating positions. We have uh, eliminated three dean's positions, two in credit, one in non-credit. We have kept uh, the director of diversity position, for example, has been vacant since August, and we are not planning on filling that position. Every single position that becomes vacant is scrutinized. We don't automatically replace positions. On the contrary, we have been extremely judicious. We have tried, for example, in the Learning Resource Center, there was a media technician position. When that became vacant, we kept it unfilled for a while. Then we tried to work with a 50% fill of that. After about six months of that, um, uh, Jack Friedlander brought to my attention that uh, after trying for six months, it was just simply not possible for the Learning Resource Center to serve our students, so we moved that position back to 100%. So the reason we were able to increase the reserves by 13.6 million over the last three years is because we have been extremely careful and no expenditure is made lightly. Uh, this is not a college that spends, on the contrary. We are extremely careful. The other question raised during the citizens' comments that appears um, that there is a large increase in benefits and other areas. As we explained to the board before, we budget positions as if they are fully filled for a year. However, they, there is a certain vacancy factor that occurs throughout the year, and that's part of that budget. What actually gets spent will be less than what's budgeted. However, we don't know who is going to retire or resign and when, but there is a vacancy factor. And actually what Leslie Griffin, um, Joe, and others are working is um, you express the desire or some of you expressed the desire to have a budget that actually comes with projections that are closer reflecting the more likely level of expenditure uh, of what we think is going to happen. So what we are going to bring in the next iteration of projections is certain projections that will include the vacancy factor, for example, rather than budgeting fully all positions as if they were all full the entire year, which again, we know every year we have a certain vacancy factor happening. So I want to bring this up because, again, there is a constant refinement happening here. And we've done so well fiscally at this college because we are very careful. This is not a college that spends. And we are a very lean operation, and as Liz mentioned many times, we cannot fill with our lease uh, positions that become vacant from the classified staff, that, and we don't do that. Um, so I, I want to reiterate that aspect. Thank you. Dr. Haslund? Yeah. I, um, I had some prepared comments on the budget. Just I thought it might be helpful for the public. And then um, also a well, motion I, to make. I don't. And I'm, I'm not at all certain why we need to go into uh, Committee of the Whole. Uh, is there? You need to provide for a hearing opportunity right. for the public. Okay, mm -hmm. and that's that's the stimulus for the for the motion. Uh, yes. Okay, so do you would you like to use your time first, or shall we go into a committee of the whole and then have you talk about it? Do you have uh, any feelings for it? It's up to you. Either one doesn't matter to me. Okay, then for the sake of good order, let's have a motion to go into the committee in the whole for the purpose of hearing um, or conducting a hearing about the budget. So moved. Second. Moved. Second. Uh, discussion? Hearing none. All in favor say aye. 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 Uh, yes, so yes, now yes, will yes. be the citizens. Yeah. <laughs>
Yes, you do. I have it right here. Okay. Uh, I, I take it that the motion was carried unanimously. Yes. Uh, objections? No. Okay. In which case, uh, the floor is yours. Well, well, no, now you'll have to let the citizen speak because now is the hearing. You moved into the hearing part. That's, your, that's what oh, okay. just happened. All right, then can you hold on? I can hold on. Okay. Uh, we have one speaker for the public hearing part of this, and that is Liz. Good afternoon again. This time I'm speaking as the uh, president of the CSA Chapter 289 for Santa Barbara City College. Um, I want to do this specifically as my presidency of CSEA because CSEA is what's called the exclusive representative for the classified staff. It's not really shared governance. And in your draft proposal that you had, I was concerned because you talk about stakeholder shared governance. Now, as an exclusive representative, there's a scope of, of bargaining that we are interested in that we have the legal right to. That includes workload, job descriptions, which are ours, reorganizations, furloughs, hours reductions, hours, and it goes on. But those are kind of some of the things that are referred to in your document. I'm concerned that, and I, I've, I've said this before, but I'm not sure I'm heard. We're very particular as the union, as our rights as the exclusive representative. If you go and start doing reorganizations and job changes to our job descriptions, we're not going to be too happy. We're very kind of protective of our rights in certain areas. We fought for them over many decades, I should say, and we use a lot of force to enforce those. I mean, that, that, it's our right to deal with the items, plus many more items. And over the years, we've developed a very good working relationship with the district. It's taken a while, you know. I've been doing this for quite a while, and it started out, you know, I dealt with a very kind of hostile board, and we had unfair labor practices and some grievances, and we've worked beyond that. Because the district has recognized that we have our job to do, we have our rights. You may be new, some of you, and you may not understand that. You need to understand that because it's very important to us and we'll enforce that to the extent of the law that we can. So when you get talking about stakeholder shared governance, that's us. You can't just go and decide, let's have a committee and let's redo all the job descriptions. You can't do anything to the job descriptions. You can't meet directly with employees to ask for reduction of hours or for furloughs. You have to negotiate with exclusive representative. That's what it means, exclusive. That's us. So I really wanted to reiterate that because I would like to continue with a good ro working relationship between CSEA and the board and HR. But you need to understand that we're very serious about this. And we expect you to, to, to understand our rights in this issue. Any questions? Do I need to no, explain thank, it? Thank you for your comments, Liz. I believe we understood them the last couple I, well, times you brought up. And, and I just want, if I, I mean, not last thing I think any member of this board wants to do is get in into job descriptions and we would rely on the president to to uh, facilitate any anything that's in that budget discussion document and we've reiterated that a couple of times so rest assured we don't want to infringe on the rights of your union you I, I hear that but I want to make sure okay well because I'm on we, TV because we have fought with that a long that. time and sometimes I hear other things and I just want to reiterate it. It's very important, especially in these type of discussions where you seem to have targeted the staff right now as far as the cuts. And so if that happens, we need to have a role. Thank you. Okay. Um, presentation of the budget or, or is it, would you like to speak at this point? We can, you need to move out of the hearing part. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Motion to move out of the hearing. Second. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. I'll figure it out eventually. I take it the motion carried. We're now back into regular session. 
Okay. Dr. Saban, did you have a planned presentation through the budget? I just had some comments. In, you've no, seen normally we don't do this presentation. This is why we do it at the study session. I, I was hope, yeah. hoping that was the case. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I, I do, do have some prepared comments about the budget that I just wanted to share in the public forum. Uh, but first, I'm just going to wing it with some comments that will probably... Um, I'll probably end up tripping over myself, but in response to people that are expressing concerns uh, about the division of the school and unity between credit and non-credit, I just, I just want to assure you that I feel very unified, a lot of unity on this board, and we hear more coming from the public towards us than I think we are talking about it amongst ourselves, and um, so. I would just encourage everyone to listen to each of us more at the board meetings because I feel we're pretty unified on wanting to work together to come up with a budget that's going to best serve all of our students. Um, and to the extent that speakers could speak in a positive and unifying, in positive and unifying terms, I think it would just help the whole community. Um, you know, everyone wants to lobby for their specific, specific agendas, whether it's credit or non-credit. But if that can be done in a positive light, speaking of the community as a whole, I think it would be less of a distraction to all of us in, in working through this. We have to be into this together. We have huge cuts in front of us. And um, to the extent that you, some of you could put your worries aside on, on fractiousness between, it, between the members of the board, it, it would be great. Um, so, I, uh, Dr. Serban already covered some of the items about the budget. We understand it's a tentative budget and it's got a long ways to go between where it is right now and where the final adopted budget will go. Um, I just wanted to give a, just a little iteration of, of what's gone on the last few months in terms of the boards um, receiving information and our, our feelings uh, and statements as a board about the budget process. So this budget before us assumes that the state funding for the college will be reduced 6.8 million next year and the following years and anticipates using existing reserves to phase in the impact of these cuts over three years. A reduction of 6.8 million currently appears to be the most likely scenario, but it's not certain, as Dr. Serban said, um, cuts could be higher or lower. So um, we've had to, through the last three or four months, I know as it's gone through its iterative process, we've had to be aware of that, as we will have to be uh, until the final state budget is adopted. So board members have been reviewing budget information and proposed recommendations from the superintendent president since the February 23rd board study session. At the board fiscal subcommittee meeting on March 7th, Committee members reached a consensus on three recommendations, and the members of that committee are um, uh, Trustee Livingston, myself, and, and Trustee Croninger. And the three recommendations were six, seven, and eight on the list of recommendations that were included as attachment three to the agenda for that March 7th meeting. So this consensus was reached in part to communicate to the total board that the individual committee members were recommending, number one, that the college not be placed in a position where we need to borrow in the foreseeable future. So uh, that's a strong recommendation from the fiscal committee, and, and I, 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 won't, I can't speak for other board members, but uh, we've spoken about it in board meetings, and I, I trust they're along with us on that. The number two, the recommendation was that we wanted to preserve general fund reserves in the amount of approximately 19 million to meet state requirements and assure sufficient cash flow. Uh, with the May revise, that number might change just a little bit because of changes in deferred payments we're going to expect. But as of March 7th, the fiscal committee recommended, um, accepted that recommendation from the president. And number three was that we agreed with the annual transfers to construction and equipment funds as proposed. So these were three very strong recommendations put before us. And since March 7th, it's been our understanding that that's the direction we want to go with this budget. And I believe it still is. In regard to the three-year phased approach to state budget cuts since the February 23rd board study session up through May 12th, Budget documents have stated that, and I'm quoting here, the reserves we currently have are serving us extremely well and will allow us to implement this phased approach. 
So we've heard that up through May 12th as a board in the documents we've received. But what we have before us is a tentative budget that projects only 14.4 million in general fund reserves by the end of next year. This budget also pro uh, proposes to increase spending for equipment and construction over last year. And we were just given some details on that. Well, I mean, we've had the details, but there was a pr presentation made. Uh, these expenditures are going to deplete sources of discretionary cash if needed for payroll and other expenses. Overall, this budget is projected to reduce total reserves on the order of $25 million over the three-year phase-in. So if you all remember from the um, graphs that Trustee Croninger and I prepared, with the $44 million in reserves we currently have, including the $8 million in JPA's funding, this tentative budget shows that we would spend $25 million of that. Phase-in information presented to the board for the $6.8 million cut, which we discussed February 23rd, indicated a use of about $7.6 million in reserves, as opposed to this $25 million that's in the tentative budget. The tentative budget first presented as part of the May 12th agenda does not reflect the recommendations of the board, fiscal subcommittee, nor stated goals of, state, of the board members. Materials presented to us indicate that this phase-in follows a fiscally conservative approach. But even after the board members asked to remove $6 million in proposed construction spending on May 16th, the projections for this tentative budget do not allow us to maintain the reserves that we need for fiscal stability. The budget will need significant additional work by shared governance groups prior to presentation for final adoption. Given this new information on the impact on reserves, it's important to look at many alternatives, some of which were suggested in the draft budget guideline discussion document presented to the board May 12th. However, at this time, again, given the anticipated impact on reserves of 25 million, I would like to suggest implementing a hiring chill effective immediately. And a hiring chill is an alternative to employee layoffs. It'll allow the college to consider consolidating employees or to restructure departments. Another component of a hiring chill is to put vacated positions on hold if they're not deemed essential to providing services vital to the mission of the college. In the event that a budget can be developed by September that does not unduly impact reserves, the hiring chill could be lifted. Imposing it now maintains flexibility and reduces the probability of layoffs in the future. Thank you. Comments? Mushroom? Um, I'd just like to add that I concur with um, Trustee Macker's concerns. Um, I appreciate the fact that this is a tentative budget. Um, it, it seems to me to be perhaps uh, more tentative than many years because of the difficulties that we are facing to getting to what I would consider a more realistic budget that will enable us to maintain sufficient reserves and our fiscal stability. Um, when we looked at the budget on May 12th and May 16th, we were looking at a reduction in one year of basically $20 million from our reserves. Um, that's almost all of our general fund reserves. Uh, there are some discretionary cash, as we know, in equipment construction and JPA, but that's a huge bite. And that's why the trustees said take out the $6 million that was in there for drama music and place it back in Measure V. Um, but that alone, as Trustee Macker has indicated, I agree, is not enough. We need to work together. Um, shared governance, Liz, the, the union reps, all of us, to come to a more realistic budget before we get to the final in, in the fall. And what I think a hiring chill now would do for us is give us flexibility. Because if when we get to it in September, uh, we find that we don't need that kind of chill, we can certainly lift it. But in the meantime, we are rather rapidly proposing to fill positions that we will have to live with. And I realize it's kind of a natural human response if you see this kind of a proposal to say, 
gosh, I want to get my position that I know is coming up vacant in ahead of a chill um, because I don't want it to be impacted. But we're trying to work together here. We're trying to bring us all together to make the best decisions for the college as a whole. And if we don't maintain that flexibility, then we'll be forced into un very unfortunate decisions, perhaps, like layoffs. And we don't want to go there. Um, we want to prevent that. So the flexibility here that we're trying to preserve by imposing a chill and making, it, making us really think hard about um, whether we need to fill all of those vacancies and how we can deal with bringing our costs down in line with the reduction that we're looking at um, is just very important. Okay, Dr. Subban. Um, I'd like to make a few comments. Uh, first of all, as I mentioned earlier, we don't just fill positions. Uh, we have never just filled positions just because they became vacant. I gave you examples of specific positions that were eliminated once vacancies occurred. I gave you examples of positions that were kept vacant for a long time. That's how we saved and increased the reserves by 13.6 million in three years. So um, this is something that our management also works with the CSEA and classified uh, staff. This is not a shared governance issue. Um, vacancies are not up for debate through the shared governance process. Again, this is not um, purview of shared governance, as Liz explained earlier. Uh, we have been very effective in doing this. So uh, to say that, uh, you know, it's human nature just to try to feel that we, that's not how we function. And so um, basically is we are already doing this, we have done this, uh, artificially imposing something that we have been very effective of managing. I'm not entirely sure what will accomplish at this point. Um, having the board uh, review and approve uh, whether a replacement should occur seems, you know, again, unnecessary because we have proven that that's not how we function. We are very careful with all positions. And so, um, you know, I, I want to make that point again because I don't think, um, I mean, even though we mentioned this before, I don't think I feel it's been acknowledged and how effective we have been in doing so. Second of all, um, we are also engaging in an analysis of our hourly short-term workers and student workers because, as I mentioned before, you can't say that we are not filling positions when we have hourly workers and short-term workers available. Uh, it's different scopes of work, but um, the other point that I think it's important to um, bring back is what the agreement was after the two-day marathon study session on budget May 12 and 16, and I appreciate uh, really the thoughtful approach all of you have taken. I think that's very important, and I appreciate your discussion and level of engagement was very good. And that's what we need to do, I agree. We all need to look at everything together. But the agreement reached on May 16 and was the consensus of the board is that the proposals from trustee Macker and Kroniger, uh, the document you provided, will uh, go through a consultation process first that will bring uh, you know, the result or the input through that governance process and then to the best of our abilities, uh, and you know what's reasonable will be incorporated in the adopted budget. Um, I think it's important to allow for that consultation rather than taking one particular measure from the dead list and imposing it at this point. Um, I believe strongly in our consultative process. This is another hallmark of what has made this BCC one of the best colleges in the state and in the nation. This input is necessary. You yourselves mentioned many times how important it is to allow for consultative processes. So the agreement was that this document with all those various elements will go through the consultative process. I have called a special meeting of the College Planning Council on June 17 for that specific purpose. Normally we don't meet during the summer. Uh, I appreciate all the faculty who instead of enjoying their, their summer break, will be there discussing this document. 
Uh, so uh, I think it's important to fulfill the agreements that we make together. John? Um, at the last facilities committee meeting, we did discuss if we took the $6 million away from the Garmin, there are significant cascading events as a result of that. It isn't just simply a standalone, it cascades. So um, I'm assuming that fuller discussion will be coming before the board so that we don't necessarily look at we just save $6 million because we save it and we pay heavily in other areas. So it needs to be um, given a little more sensitivity than just looking at it as a line item to take out of the budget. Okay. Luis? Yeah, I would like to underline uh, uh, some of the comments made by Dr. Serban. And it was my understanding that at the study session when Trustee Macker and uh, uh, Croninger presented their document that it was agreed as Dr. Serban had um, has just indicated that it would be taken under consideration and through the consultative process. So I would like to suspend any more discussion on the document and let's have it go through the process that uh, has worked so well over the years. Marcia. Um I think we all appreciate the importance of the governance process, and I hope I emphasized it already in my comments. Uh, I am uncomfortable, we're being asked to adopt a tentative budget here, and I'm uncomfortable in that this budget, among other things, proposes $450,000 in actual savings against a $6.8 million reduction in revenue for next year. Um, for a number of other reasons that we've talked about earlier, the math is not comforting here. It is not good for me to, to feel comfortable adopting a tentative budget, which, as Trustee Livingston has pointed out, if you're using reserves, um, you need a two-thirds vote to adopt. Uh, among other things, we did have a presentation on equipment and construction. Uh, we are in this tentative budget proposing to increase our spending on construction equipment by 6.7 million over last year. That's as much as the reduction on top of the 6.8 million reduction. And then we're proposing that we'll cut it again by 5.8 million for the two following years. I need more information to understand is that realistic? Uh, are we planning realistically for those two following years or are we digging a bigger hole then uh, than we seem to have now when we're already um, reducing our reserves by 13.8 million uh, next year alone. So this is why the idea of a hiring chill a higher standard, a more thoughtful, and I agree that I'm, I'm confident we've already gone through some thoughtful processes as we hire, but I'm seeing a lot of hiring come through. I'm seeing a lot of openings come through on the emails. I'm seeing, um, when I looked at the hourly employee list and the placeholder list um, in the uh, agenda for today, uh, I looked at what we were proposing last year, and there's 34% more full-year hourly positions in, on the credit side alone uh, than last year. That's kind of a big jump in a year when we're looking toward cutting expenses. And I recognize that all of those are up for filling and that we will adjust as we go along, but it's uncomfortable to get all of this up front when we haven't yet dealt with how do we get to a realistic budget. I feel like we're cutting off our flexibility and we need that flexibility. <coughs> okay. Um, regarding the hourly comment, um, I, I did receive an email from Trustee Croninger about 2.30 p.m. and uh, I responded as quickly as I could, 3.55 p.m. as I was coming up. Uh, so 
I appreciate you may not have had the chance to, to, to read the answer, but uh, now that, that you pose the question, I would like to address it because I think it's important for the public to understand how this works. Um, hourly workers need to be authorized by the board on a fiscal year basis, and this work must be authorized by the board before it is performed. Uh, of all of the board meetings during the year, the June board meeting traditionally includes the largest number of hourlies to be authorized to work in the upcoming fiscal year. There are not, there are not more names, including on this June 2011 board agenda than on previous years, and hopefully there, there are actually fewer over the prior years. The June, 2000, June 24, 2010 agenda last year included 179 hourly names to be approved on the credit side. The agenda today includes 143 names. It's fewer names than last year. You can anticipate a surge in the number of student workers being hired, processed on the upcoming August and September agendas and again in January, because student workers are hired by semester, not by fiscal year. These hourly workers to be approved are not doing work that previously belonged to bargaining union positions. This is not bargaining unit work. These names do not represent an increased commitment to hire. The very real restraints on hourly employment continue to be there are rules. These people cannot work more than a certain number of hours per week and the total number of hours accumulated for a fiscal year. So there are rules we follow. And the authorization to, you would give for them to work doesn't mean, doesn't commit the college to the work. It's just an authorization for us to be able to use them if we need them. We process these individuals so that we can Use, this, use them if and when they are needed during the upcoming fiscal year. We have also reduced the expenditures on the hourly side quite significantly, actually, over these last three years. So we are not spending more. On the contrary, we are spending less. And the, the names, the number of names are fewer names than last year. So I, I just want to clarify this because I think it's important. Please. Yeah, I just um, want to remind the board that, again, this is a tentative budget, and I think that a lot of concerns that Trustee uh, Croninger has raised are valid, and I appreciate the work that um, Trustee Macron Croninger did, but again, I want to get that work in the process of the, the consultative process and see where we come out. I think um, administration has been flexible to in incorporate that, your work into it, which is, you know, significant amount of work. So I would like to remind us it is a tentative budget, and let's see how um, those numbers fare out as it goes through the process. Okay, if we can have uh, maybe one or two more comments, and let's see if we can't enact a budget. Oh, Marty? Just, just um, I wanted to thank uh, the folks that have been working on this. It's a lot of work, I understand. And uh, it looks like a good budget because I'm very impressed with uh, um, there must be some kind of a, an acknowledgement throughout the college that we shouldn't be spending money because the amount of money that's spent, the expenditures, is below budget. And it's, so that's good. Uh, I appreciate that. We are in tough times. Um, my biggest concern on this budget, and I, I waited to hear the discussion, my biggest concern, and I, I understand about the hiring, also as a union president for four years, or two years, I understand what that means. But um, my biggest concern is the use of the reserves. And I have not seen, and I think, I think you will be discussing this probably at the Planning Council, I don't know, at the Academic Senate, which is going to meet in August too. I'm just not sure, but the use of the reserves troubles me. Because in a couple years, when we're down to one million in reserves, I'm not, I'm just not clear. Maybe I'm not clairvoyant enough, but usually I can um, use them kind of a Pollyanna and say, well, in two years we'll be much better off in the state. And I don't see that happening. I really think we've got some problems ahead of us in the state and consequently here at, at the school. So. Um, I would like to save a lot more in reserves than we're talking about here, and so I guess, I guess that that um, 
the budget using a certain amount of reserves this year and next year, mostly next year and the year after, really troubles me. So I need to have that discussion. Okay. Anybody else? Um, just a minor clarification, or, or maybe not. Um, the, the names, number of names may be the same, but I'm referring to the number of, um, including the number of placeholder positions, in, and those seem to have increased from 522 last year to um, 732 this year. So that's really where a lot of the numbers increase is. There's a lot more placeholders with no people attached to them, and that's something that um, you know, I would so would you like to clarify, can you come to the microphone, please? Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to try to clarify this, and I appreciate that it's confusing. That is a daunting list of both names and placeholders. It is likely that there are names on that list who will never perform any work for the college. Placeholders are there because individuals can not necessarily be readily found, so we give people an opportunity when they do find an individual and they do need to have some work done. If the placeholder is approved by the board, um, they have the opportunity to bring someone in to do the work. But many times, course schedules, classes, individual needs mean that we have many more placeholders and many individuals approved than actually work. And even if an individual on this list works, it doesn't mean they're working the full 19 and a half hours a week times 175 days for the year. The limit is the budgetary amount that is allocated for the work, not the number of names, not the number of placeholders. I, I appreciate that it seems counterintuitive, but um, it's, it's the budget that, that is controlling this. And there is nothing about approving these individuals or these placeholders that prevents us in any way as the year goes on, as uh, a final budget is adopted to add additional restraints. Um, I appreciate that. I'm, I'm interested in us getting to that budget number, obviously, and, you know, what is our actual expectation of expenditure next year, but I'm also still confused why such an increase for over last year. Uh, I think Dr. Jack Friedlander can help further clarify this question. I'll try. Well, <laughs> well don't come all the way here if you can't explain it. <laughs> Since Paul Bishop got on camera, I wanted to have my turn. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm finished. Uh, so the, um, he, he, there's two possible explanations. One is that each unit, major unit of the college, like the credit, non-credit, so forth, we have very large, aggressive um, targets we have to meet in reducing our hourly accounts. Um, you know, student worker accounts and short-term hourly, which we have not implemented, but they're for this year. And the reason why is by the time we got to knowing what those targets are and increasing them, the faculty were gone, you know, for the summer. And so we need to be wait for them to come back to engage in that consultation process. But it'll be a fast consultation process. And we'll be doing the work over the summer to prepare our recommendations to them because that's money coming out of this year's budget, out of the hourly um, you know, budgets. Second thing is we did um, last year restore money for um, you know, tutors and readers. And so this year the faculty, uh, the department submitted placeholders you know, for those positions, um, which is a lot of, of individuals who are doing you know, 10 hours here, five hours there, six hours there um, for that. Again, how much of that, um, our priority is to keep the tutors and readers and reduce elsewhere, but we haven't taken that out of the budget yet. So although that's a very large list, long list, um, with the cuts we plan to make, it, probably, it'll, it'll, it will not, as Sue said, um, many of those positions will remain as placeholders and not, and not filled. So that's the only thing I wanted to add in terms of clarification. 
Thank you. So, um, is that worth the trip? Absolutely. <laughs> we understand that you needed the exercise after such a long meeting. Uh, I, I believe we're at the point where we can introduce a motion to adopt the tentative budget. Well, I'd like to, to follow up on Marty's question about the reserves. I don't think yeah. that was addressed. That right. Thanks. If you would like to reiterate your question, and we can put that into the dialogue. I think it keeps coming up, so it needs to be addressed. And if you'd like to reiterate your question, Marty. Oh, I'm just concerned about the use of the reserves, and it looks like we're going to be down to $1 million after two or three years, I guess, three years. Yeah, as I That's mentioned, that, is, that was a work in progress projection, and that I mentioned earlier in my comments, we are working on refining those projections. We work hard to have these reserves. It is this college who worked hard to have the 44 million uh, that we are ending the year with. It, it is not our intention to spend reserves easily or for reasons that don't serve the college. And that, that recommendation, the, the 19 million, came from us, the college. So that's the target we want to be able to achieve through the refinements we will be working on. Um, and so we, we will be looking also for as clear a direction from you as possible. And through the next study sessions um, that we will be having before we arrive to the adopted budgets, I will be seeking additional clarification to fully understand your desired position. Um, but I personally feel very strongly about our reserves. We have made a lot of sacrifices to have this money, so I want to assure you that we feel very strongly about preserving reserves and the fiscal stability of the college. Well, it sounds like both the board and the college are on the same, you know, uh, on the same, uh, um, well, at least it, that we agree on this, um, but the budget itself doesn't agree with us. So that's well, as I mentioned before, we only know so much and we only have so much time and we need the tentative budget to pay bills July 1. And so what we are working towards as we'll go through the adopted budget process is a refinement of what you are seeing because I feel very strongly about the fiscal stability of this college as well as you do. Good. Thank you. And if it's any point of history, I remember many, many times through many college presidents, we reached the same impasse. We're handed a budget that we can't believe in at various points as it's, as it's going through its formulation. And so we just always adopted them because we're up against a deadline. And I think you were present at the time when we were just laughing our way through a bad budget because it was such, such a delay, which was misinterpreted by the public that we weren't serious about it, but it was just because there was such a long delay and because we had this deadline, we, you know, we could have passed the New York Times as a budget because the, the numbers just simply weren't there. So it did give the impression that we were treating this less than seriously, but it's just one of the ongoing complications of dealing with money coming from Sacramento, budgets coming from Sacramento, deadlines. A lot of these just simply don't coordinate. However, the comfort is we have a history as an institution. Peter, you've been with the institution for a long time. You know that budgets have been fought over, and when there's plenty of money, it, it, it's a happy time that, that people want to share, and this is going to be a, a different challenge because it's going to be lower, but it's always something that's a rolling, ongoing resolution, but we've never failed the college. We've never failed the college. I've been on, Luis has been on for 17 years, and we've been through difficult times. We've been through changes of the budget after the budget is approved. We've been through times when we've allocated money and we've tried to do it as prudently we, as we can, that we don't commit to ongoing expenses that we can't meet. And so sometimes some of these artificial deadlines we have to meet, we just have to take a little bit on trust and appreciation for the long track record that Santa Barbara City College is not going to throw away. And there are plenty of times as this moves forward that when we see something that is out of sync, we are responsive and we're responsible. And um, I'm sorry that's in question. 
I don't think it's healthy for the community debate to, to be faced with that sort of perception. But it's also difficult because when you look at the process, the process is, is erratic. And um, so I only make a, a defense for who we've been in the past, who we want to be, and that there is absolutely no one anywhere who doesn't want us to retain the position that we have. And sometimes we have to stumble through some of these deadlines that we don't impose. And if they have a deadline, we wish we had a deadline that they'd give us the money or the budget at the same time so we could do a little more precision in our planning. So history, context. Thank you. And appreciation for the frustration. And if you go back in the minutes, I remember having to run in 2004, I believe, and I had to run on the idea that I had an unbalanced budget. And I was begging, please tell me, please tell me this is going to come out OK. It's going to come out OK. And it, it did. But I remember I'm going to have to go out and face the public with a budget that isn't supportable. So if that's any comfort, we've done it. Kay went through the same thing, this last one, that she was uncomfortable with where we had to be, but we ended up OK. Um, well, I think there's an emerging comfort level in that everybody seems to be saying the same thing, which is kind of unusual for this group. <laughs> um, but I, what I'm hearing is that there's genuine concern about the retention of reserves in a significant proportion to the rest of the budget. I hear that one of the areas of concern has to do with with a possible limitation, however we want to phrase that limitation on, on how many people we hire. Uh, I hear the president saying, this is in fact what we're doing. Uh, so I, I, I sense a, a good deal of, of both uh, harmony of interest as well as um, a sense of concern that, that somehow we're going to muddle through and we'll be all right. But we're going to, I think you're also hearing that we're looking at it very carefully. We're, de we're taking this responsibility seriously. And I want to thank Lisa in particular, Lisa and Marsha, for actually digging in and finding numbers that uh, I frankly would have difficulty understanding. So I, I appreciate that effort, extra effort. Are we prepared to introduce a motion to adopt the budget? I'll introduce a motion. I do have a motion prepared uh, that includes the hiring chill. I'm not sure where we're at on that. I could include it and see how it goes. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So my motion is to approve the tentative budget, provided it's understood it'll need substantial revisions to reduce the impact on reserves before it becomes a final budget in the fall. In addition, a hiring chill will be imposed effective this date with the following conditions. A hiring chill is imposed as of June 9th to 11, 2011. Faculty positions already approved by Academic Senate as of this date for rehire based on retirement or resignations are exempted. And all other proposed replacement or new hire positions not hired as of June 9th will be reevaluated and new or replacement hires. Uh, proposed will be brought first to the Board Fiscal Committee with a member with a memo addressing the proposed hire based on relevant factors, including job description, alternatives considered, and recommendations of shared governance groups and affected departments. The board fiscal committee will provide a recommendation for consideration of the full board. That's um, my motion. Oh, okay, I was going to say point of order on that. If it was a motion that isn't on the agenda, I don't think that we can. Right, that is not a motion on the agenda. And so so you, you can't pass a motion that was not on the agenda. The public didn't know about it. it. And I think as advisory can. information, yeah. it's appropriate to put in to your comments, but there's no way that we could okay. vote on that. I, I think point of order that you can. Um, the motion is to adopt the tentative budget with a condition, and I don't think that it's inappropriate to uh, impose a condition with that um, adoption. I mean, it's part of the discretion you have in considering whether to move forward or not. OK, so. No, I mean, I'm sorry, no. Um, it, what is being proposed is something that we would need to have comment on if it's going to be incorporated. I really have no problem with this being advisory. So it gets out into the public debate, but 
to just throw something with as much specific detail onto a motion without having any public notice that this is going to require it, it compromises my ability to vote for it because I might not agree with this and now I'm being forced to maybe withhold approval for something that we're just You know what, I'm going to process. withdraw my motion if I may. And um, I keep don't the first part of it. <laughs> keep the first strongly worded part of it. And we'll leave the advisory part in. That, and I, I've been hearing that pretty consistently anyway. So if the motion is to approve the tentative budget, is there a second to the motion? Second. Motion is made and it. seconded. Discussion about the motion? Mm -hmm. I, just clarification on the motion is to move on the te tentative budget as presented? Yes. Um, could we reread the provisos with that? Um, yes. Because I'm, I'm wanting to be clear that everyone understands what those are. And uh, once again, I understand the tentative budget has been very different than the adopted budget over prior years, but in this particular case, it's very, very different than the end product we hope to see um, in September. For that reason, I wrote the motion this way, to approve the tentative budget provided that, it, it's un, that it's understood it will need substantial revisions to reduce the impact on reserves before it becomes a final budget in the fall. Okay. I think we're ready to vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Abstentions? Abstain. Okay. The motion passes. So we One, have, two, just for the minutes, uh, we have two abstention, trustees Viegas and Kroniger, and we have positive votes, Livingston, Macker, Blom, and Haslung. Okay. Yes. Just to make sure we get it right this time. Okay. We move on to... Um, Dr. Haslund. Yes. I, um, I apologize that um, I'm going to have to um, leave uh, due to a commitment I mentioned to you earlier today that, um, uh, but I wanted, before leaving, I wanted to make my comments in reference to item 2.4, which uh, I do not understand why this item is on the agenda. Um, I believe it was clarified when the agenda, when the item was asked to be placed on this agenda, uh, per the minutes of May 26th, my motion to table this topic to the next study session was approved, those minutes were approved this evening, so I'd like to ask that 2.4 be deleted from the agenda tonight and be placed on the next study session where all board members are present and this topic can be discussed and, and vetted thoroughly. Comments? So if you would like that in the form of a motion, I so move. I, have we moved to? We no, haven't, I said, we haven't gotten I said there. I would like, just making he's, because he's, of, he's needing to leave. Right. Right, but I mean, have we officially moved or are we just making preliminary comments? Have we, are we discussing 2.4 now? I think you're just making a suggestion for... Uh, the you, board. Yeah. That and, and we have not be removed. Yeah. But and we if you would like it, if the board so wishes to have it in a motion, I so move prior to my departure, well, unfortunately. I, I wasn't prepared to take a motion because we, it's really out of order. Well, I guess it can be out of order if, if we approve we that it can. We agree to yeah. take it out of order. Is that okay with everybody that we take this out of order? I move that we take item 2.4 out of order. Second. The discussion of 2.4 out of order. Okay. I, I don't think we need a motion so long as there's consent. Okay. Um, and in which case your motion is in order. Uh, it's moved to uh, remove item 2.4 from the agenda. Is there a second to the motion? I would move, or I would also ask consideration, if, since the motion is on the floor. Um, the, the maybe the wording has appropriately. To be second. Second. First. Yeah. Okay. No second. The motion dies. Uh, I would just like to use the wording. I would like to postpone item 2.4 to the next study session as a time certain. So it's, I think there might have been some controversy over whether one tabled the motion or whether one postponed the motion. So I am moving that we postpone this to the next study session. Well, it was originally tabled to the next study session. Right, and there was some question as to whether the motion itself was appropriate because a motion to table is 
requiring that out in front there's something else that we have to take and therefore this item is put aside and then it's returned immediately after uh, that item has been taken care of. Okay. Um, so Does postpone work better? Um, according to my reading of Robert's rules, yes, it does. a postponement, and particularly to a time certain, so a device a, can be postponed indefinitely, and I have no intention of doing this because I would like okay to say with, with, I think it's a valuable topic. Yeah, okay. my so real concern is, is um, the fact that it appeared on tonight's agenda, and um, well, I think we need to be consistent with parliamentary procedure. Okay, in which case you have no objection to substituting Joan's motion to postpone to a time certain for the next study session. Correct. Is there a second? Or date certain. We there have, a yeah, there's a problem with that in that um, you've, you've indicated two things. You'd like it to be on a study session, which is, I think, appropriate. But the second thing, and we can't vote there, but we can talk. Uh, but the, the other thing is you've also indicated you wanted a time when all seven of us are in there. And we won't well, be until about October, I don't think. I think we've got various people on various vacations. July 14th study session, according to current schedules, all board members are present at the July 14th study session. So I don't mind, since I'm the only one missing this coming study session, if you go ahead and talk about it, because I understand the issue. Mm -hmm. And um, I've talked to um, um, Trustee Croninger about it, um, and I'm fine with it. I mean, I understand everything about it, so I don't need to talk about it and not vote. Uh, so I'd be happy to have it if we can uh, postpone it to the study session on the 20, what is it? 23rd. is fine with me. I won't be there, but that's okay. Okay. So would it then be on for a decision in July? And mm -hmm. are we all there then? Well, you have to talk about it first and figure At it out. At the July board meeting? Yes, I mean, you know, July 28th board meeting, again, according to your schedules, everybody's here. Okay. That okay. sounds good. And in, in the discussion, what I was looking at, and again, I want to make clear, the substance of it is, is timely, wonderful, and supported. I am concerned about the process, and I'm concerned about the format of this particular resolution. So when we go into discussion of this item in study session, I would like to have some reference to Board Policy 2341, Board Policy 2715, Board Policy 2220, Board Policy 2715, Board Policy 2430, 2410, 2410. Um, it, because this is going to be my thing. Let's do this, but let's do it in a governance process where we're in conformance with how we do business as we've set out. So I want it to go forward, but I want it to go forward with the recognition that there is policy development guidelines within our own written documents that I believe should be taken into consideration. So it's not meant to distort it, but just to, to refine it, make it a better product, and make sure that we're all on the same page and discuss the scope of what the intent is here. Okay, but now we have a Can you repeat motion? the motion to make sure <laughs> that we know what the motion is? I'm, I'm, the, I'm in doubt as to, I mean, the motion was to postpone. To I June 23rd, study June session. June 23rd. Okay. Information on. Okay. That, we're, we're, too much information. <laughs> yes. Then I would like to amend the motion to postpone discussion to June 23rd and decision at the following board meeting. Um, okay. Well, I was going to say. So that we don't keep getting this delayed because somebody at the last minute can't come. I mean, the criteria here is we've got to be able to do business when we're not all here, or we won't get any business done. The motion so. is <laughs> Let me properly, remind you that if properly amended, if we need a second for the amendment. Uh, Were you going to do that? No. Do I have to? No. Do you I, I have no There's role no in second. accepting an amendment. I would object no. to it. Would, is there a, a second to the amendment? Tell me what the amendment is. I'm sorry. The second, the amendment is to, um, to bring it up for a vote at the subsequent board meeting. Oh. So the discussion takes place on the June 23rd meeting, and the amendment says we will decide on the subsequent. How, how can Let we do we that without even having discussed it? Yeah. I mean, basically, that's what the study session is for. 
So I would not to, I would not like to put a specific date and time because the study session is to discuss things. If there is a consensus of the board to move it forward to a board meeting for approval, it is decided at that study session, not tonight. Well, then we have an issue with Trustee Bloom being not present at the next study session. Well, she's indicated that it doesn't no, matter to her. No, 23rd yeah. is fine. She's yeah, fine. but without everyone present, then how are we going to move it forward to the next meeting for decision if there is a... We work on consensus yeah. Yeah. at study yeah. sessions. Right. Right. We don't vote. Things forward. I'm not worried about that. All right. Okay, do I hear that the amendment is withdrawn? Since it didn't get a second, maybe it is. I don't think okay. it matters. All right, so we're back to the original motion, which is to postpone this um, resolution until the June it's not 23rd a resolution. Session. It's a discussion item, so it's. I'm that's sorry, critical. you you Move called it two point four. Just you called it a resolution. Two point four. Okay, all in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Are there abstentions? Uh, I'm abstaining. One abstention. Um, My apologies, I have to. Okay. Good. We revert to item 2.3, discussion of proposed. 2.2. Um, 2.2. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, 2.2. We, um, we need a vote on 2.2. Okay. Who is going to speak to that? We don't need to speak to it unless you have questions. Okay. No. Does this require action? Yes. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the modification to health benefits allocation? So moved. So second. Moved. Okay, is there a second? Marty, mm -hmm. seconds? Yes. We're quickly losing both our trustees and our audience, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll manage to muddle through. The motion is made and seconded. Discussion? Questions? Hearing none, we move to a vote. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay? Thanks. Abstentions? Okay, the motion is carried. Item 2.3. Um, is there a motion to... This is not, this is for discussion, Trustee Macker, on okay. behalf of That's the right. Community there's, Relations Committee. There's no recommendation here, so, um, Lisa, do you want to talk to this? Uh, we all have the sheet in front of us, item 2.3. The Community Relations uh, Committee has met a couple times discussing our charge, and uh, which has not been finalized. Um, but we are recommending to the board that the board have a community budget forum, one or two, beginning with the first one this summer. It would be hosted by the board of trustees. Uh, the proposed outcomes of the forums would be to, um, there's five outcomes, generate attention for the college and reintroduce the college and outline its broader community mission. Number two, provide an overview of or impart understanding of the relationship between the college and state funding, you know, how the cuts in the budget, state budgets are affecting um, our community college locally. We want to be able to clearly communicate the impact of the current budget situation on services which SBCC provides. Again, in the context of the greater community, it would be an opportunity for the trustees to engage with members of the public. and. Um, share what's going on with the budget. Number four, to define, communicate what is needed from the community. Um, number five, uh, this would also provide um, encouragement to the public and facility for participation in budget discussion and solutions over the following weeks and into the future. So we're hoping that these forums will invite members of the community to engage with the college um, and as has already been started with our um, suggestion box <laughs> and website um, so that the greater goal of this budget forum is just to engage with the community and provide opportunity um, to further explore the relationship with the community. Um, Do you have dates for, for this? You know, we're looking at, at the last part of July or first week in August, and I know everybody's uh, calendars are very busy, and it, would it work that we could just uh, circulate emails and come up with a date? Sure. I think that would be best. Yes. Uh, okay. July 28th is the date of the board meeting, so that would be a date that to the... Yeah, I just heard that. <laughs> we might aim for that date. So this is uh, for discussion. Is there any? It's for discussion, yeah. 
Yeah, so then it, if it's something that we would want to add as an action item at the board study session since everything's all flipped around or do you want to wait till the next board meeting, then we're into, I mean, I, I would assume we'd want to put it on as an action item at the next study session. Yeah. Well, um, does it require? You can just reach consensus if you want. I mean, uh, but the next well, study session, fine. if, if it's, it's to be a vote, then we have to schedule a regular meeting in conjunction with the study session such that you can actually have action items to take a vote on, which we can do. It's not a problem. We can have a regular meeting in conjunction with the study session. Yeah, for if once, I don't sense okay a huge do a amount consensus. of controversy over having a, 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 a community forum, so I don't know that. Sorry? I, I, don't, I don't sense any controversy over this okay. issue. Again, it just processes and format when something comes before the board as a discussion yeah. item rather than an action item. Um, I, you know, if we take liberty, I don't know if we can take liberty with a discussion item and turn it into an action item. I don't know. We could have a regular portion uh, on June 23rd that allows for vote, and then you would move into the study session, which is only discussion without the vote. And if you like, you can have this item to take action on. Yeah, sure. let's do that. Yeah, I think time is important, uh, given the constraints of the summer. So if we could do that, if, if that works that, for you. That's fine reasons. with me. I just really don't think we should get into the informality of something being noticed as a discussion item, and then it becomes a commitment of the college and you know resources and okay. everything else. So I mean, it could have come as an action item. So just as we discipline our, ourselves or what our intent is, it, that could have come as an action item, as an agenda item. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask that we move on to um, item uh, three, which is uh, Human Resources and Legal Affairs with Sue Ehrlich before she expires sitting there waiting for us to. Nice. Oh, a retirement. All right. Well, I look <laughs> a like I'm vacancy. <laughs> a vacancy. Thank we don't you for have your to consideration. Fill. I have one item. Uh, for which I need to add some detail. It is 3.1A. Um, I'm pleased to tell you that the um, position of Director of Athletics will be filled by Ryan Byrne, that's B-Y-R-N-E. Uh, the rate will be 156 slash one. The actual start date will be July 5th, not July 1st. I think July 1st was printed on your agenda. Yes. I have no other um, modifications to the agenda. I submit it for your approval. Yes. Uh, excuse me, we're going to have to... You read position? Uh, I don't have any information for that one at this time, so we're going to have to pull that one. Thank you. I'm sorry, which one were you pulling? 3.1G. Okay. 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 Is there a motion to approve the report of of uh, uh, HRLA? Move approval of the 3.1 consent items. Right. Is there such a motion? There is. I just. Oh, you I'll did. Second. Okay. Motion is made and seconded. And that includes Ryan Byrne. Then. Right. That excludes. Yeah. Thank you. Includes Ryan Byrne and it excludes 3.1G. Yes. Okay, are we ready to take a vote? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed nay. Abstentions unanimously carried. Thank you. Thank you very much. We move on to the next agenda item, which is H10. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I'm here to present the business services items for you. There are a number of consent items. Uh, normally you take those as a whole, but I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have on them before you take action on them. Thank you, Leslie. I think we've, we've looked at these. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda on item 6.1? So moved. Marty moves. Is there a second? Second. Moves and seconded. Discussion? 
Questions for Leslie? There was an editorial about who's responsible for the increases in health care costs, and they said, we are, because we're the purchasers, and we're just somehow not getting a good enough deal. And it was, the I mean, everybody said, well, it's the doctor's costs, or it's this cost, or it's lawyer liability costs. But somebody said, no, it's you, you people who are big purchasers of large health insurance. It's like demand, right? Yeah. And I thought, well, you know, we've never really quite looked at it that way. Um, I mean, it always seems like it's a one-sided deal when they hand down these things. I, I'm just throwing that out into the cosmos because I think it's something that maybe collectively we all have to start. You know, I mean, just speaking very collectively that we as the consumers of these somehow have to get a message across that you just can't keep raising fees and if we, I don't know what we could do about it, but right now the, the helplessness of it is unfortunate, but you know, at least it's in the dialogue. I don't well, think you're we're not alone in, in trying to strategize how to find affordable health insurance for our employees. All governments are in the same boat. And there, there have been a number of strategies that we have been pursuing. Uh, we've been offering different insurance plans to our employees to let them pick and choose. Do you want a larger deductible and then the premium will be less? Uh, also for our um, prescription drugs, uh, if you have generics versus the formulaics, you know, they're at a cheaper cost. So we are trying to be aggressive in finding alternatives for employees, but it's just the fact of the economics that the premiums are going up, they go up every year. And I guess the other thing, and you know, I pursued it, but those of us on Medicare, it's mm -hmm. a shame that we can't qualify as if we were retired employees that would reduce district costs. Mm -hmm. um, is that, I mean, I, it was explained to me, it's not even on the table, but mm -hmm. as one of our prides of the institution is how many people live, or how many people continue working well past Medicare age, and it might be a significant. Some people do choose to. Yes, they do choose, and some of our, our uh, instructors uh, enjoy teaching into the years where others might have already retired. So that is a challenge for us, uh, and we we try to manage this best through our benefits committee, where we have representatives from all of the employee groups, and we work with professionals that we engage to help us find the best insurance, and we also belong to a collective, the CISC. Uh, system of um, handling the medical insurance needs for school districts. So we're trying to find the best strategy we can at getting you know, that critical health insurance to keep all of our employees and their families healthy. Okay. Thank you very much. We take a vote on uh, item 6.1. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, nay. Uh, carries. Abstentions, I should have asked. Okay, there are none. It carries unanimously. We move on to 6.2. Right, there are two uh, business action items. Uh, the first is authorizing the routine internal budget transfers. That's uh, item 6.2A. Correct, yes. and I, I'd be glad to answer any questions on that item if you have any questions there. Is there a motion to adopt resolution number 43? Lisa moves, Marshall um, seconds. Okay. Okay. Sometimes we take these together yeah, if it's appropriate. You can take them together. These two could be like, taken yeah. together. Yeah. Is there objection? Okay. So, so, so let's assume that the motion includes both uh, resolution 43 and 44. Um, and that's seconded. Do you have anything that needs to be said about this? Uh, no, it's just uh, we had some restricted money coming t from donors through the foundation, mm -hmm. and so we're budgeting both the revenue and the expenditures for that restricted funding. Okay. If uh, we could call the roll, uh, all in favor, please uh, so indicate when roll is called. Trustee Green. Aye. Trustee Croninger. Aye. Trustee Havlin. Aye. 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 Okay. I think the, the vote is unanimous once again. Okay. We go to item nine, which is the one that you've all been waiting for, which <laughs> so is, is to adjourn. Okay. Motion is made and seconded faster than I can even say that. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Oh, good. I'm so glad. We are adjourned. <laughs>